Glick is a leading scientist, innovator, and communicator on global water and climate issues, co-founder of the Pacific Institute in Oakland. Uh, yesterday, we had a couple other Pacific Institute uh, people, uh, and uh, one of the most innovative, independent, non-governmental organizations addressing the connections between the environment and global sustainability. That's the Pacific Institute, which uh, I get reminded they are actually very much an international organization. They were very prominent in the Stockholm water things. They have the UN water mandate and everything. They're not, you know, nice people across the bay. They're more than that. So uh, Dr. Glick's work has redefined water from the realm of engineers to the world of sustainability, human rights, and integrated thinking. He pioneered the concept of the soft path for water uh, developed the idea of peak water and has written about the need for a local water movement. Among uh, many other honors, uh, Glick received the prestigious MacArthur uh, Genius Fellowship, the U.S. Water Prize, and has been named a, quote, visionary on the environment, unquote, by the BBC. Um, he's elected to the U.S. Uh, National Academy of Sciences in 20, 2006 and is awarded in 2018 the Carl Sagan Prize for Science Popularization. Um, in 2023, he was elected, that's this year, was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, he is also the author of a number of books and papers on uh, water, the world's water series, Bottled and Sold, the story behind our obsession with bottled water. And once again, if you haven't tried the water tasting, please do. Um, 21st century U.S. water policy, and most recently, the three ages of water, which is what he'll be talking about today. And afterwards, uh, if we can get him out of the sun uh, and on the table, we'll have a book signing going on as well. Uh, so, um, Dr. Peter Glick. Thanks, So hi, everybody. Um, thanks for, for being here. It's nice to see people in person again. Uh, I know this is probably one of my first real in-person conferences in a long time. It's probably true for many of you. Uh, and thank you to Dennis and to Jennifer and to Sustainable Silicon Valley for having me. Um, so right off the bat, uh, Yvonne talked about um, TikTok and people have 15 second attention spans. And I don't, I don't have any videos, and I don't have a PowerPoint, and I, and I wrote a book, which apparently nobody reads anymore. So I, I'm going in the wrong direction. Uh, and then Dennis asked me uh, before if I cared if I talked after a uh, talk about beavers. And I love beavers. I, I'm a fly fisherman, and I learned to fly fish in beaver ponds in that cluster you had in Colorado in the Rocky Mountains in, in Colorado, and, and they're great for fly fishing for trout. Um, I, I'm a big fan of beavers, and it was a wonderful talk, Eddie. Um, so uh, my talk is going to be a little bit different. Uh, there have been some, some great talks already about very specific things that have been happening here in California and in the Silicon Valley. Uh, but Dennis asked me to talk a, a little bit about what I talked about in the book. Uh, about the three ages of water. It's a little bit of history, it's a little bit of philosophy, uh, it's a little bit of optimistic forecasting. Um, let me start by saying that I, I think we live in a pretty remarkable time. Uh, it's a time when we're in a transition from a series of crises around water, uh, the ones that we're all very familiar with, to what I would, I would argue has the potential to be, and I, I'm going to be a little more optimistic about that, the probability of a sustainable future. Um, now, it's hard to see transitions sometimes when we're in the middle of them until they've happened and we can look back at history and we can look back at our experiences. Um, but let me start with a little bit of history. Uh, when we think about water, and there's a water tasting back there, and I, I encourage you all to, to taste water. Um, what do we really know about water, about where it is, about where it comes from, about the role that water played in the, in the history of Earth, or in fact the history of the cosmos, uh, or the evolution and development of humanity? 
Uh, and what can history and science and experience tell us about the potential to solve the water crises that we see all around us? So science tells us that the very first molecules of hydrogen were created perhaps literally within a few years after the Big Bang, maybe a few thousand years after the Big Bang. Uh, oxygen took a little longer. Uh, the first stars had to form, stars of hydrogen. They, they grew, they expanded, they blew up. Um, fusion created the, the, the more complex elements, including ultimately oxygen, and that might have been a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. But as soon as we had oxygen and hydrogen, we had water. And in fact, if you look around now, around the solar system, or around the galaxy, or literally around the universe, water is pretty ubiquitous. There's, there's water pretty much everywhere. Um, you know, we look through the solar system here. Uh, there's water in the craters on Mercury near the sun. Uh, a few weeks ago, India landed a rover on the moon in a remarkable technological feat. And the place they chose to land it was near the south pole of the moon, where we know there's water ice. And they did that, and their rover is rovering around uh, the moon right now, looking for water. Uh, we know that there's water on Enceladus, one of the moons of, of Saturn, that, that may have all of the elements that are suitable for, for life. Uh, Uranus and Neptune, our outermost ice planets, actually have more ice water on them than, is, than there is water on Earth. Uh, there's water sort of everywhere we look. It's, it's a pretty remarkable thing. And we know that without water, there is no life. At least at life as we know it requires water. Uh, now, we only have one example to, to choose from, of course. But that's our understanding. So in the book, I write about the three ages of water. And the first age of water is this age. From the creation of the universe through the evolution of our solar system and ultimately the evolution of Homo sapiens. Uh, and I argue that, in fact, the success of Homo sapiens ultimately depended, that's our species, ultimately depended on our ability to manipulate the hydrologic cycle and to survive the extremes of climate and water that existed two and three hundred thousand years ago when Homo sapiens ultimately became the dominant species. Our ability to survive droughts and to survive floods and to move from water rich areas to from water poor areas to water rich areas depended on our ability to deal with water. Uh, and that again is part of the first age of water. Uh, up through the first empires of Mesopotamia and China and the Indus Valley, when those first empires again depended on their ability to manipulate water. Uh, those first empires, the Sumerians and the Babylonians and the, the Chinese, uh, early Chinese cultures, they were built alongside big rivers. And they were built alongside big rivers because that's where reliable water resources were. And it permitted them to manipulate the hydrologic cycle and to grow the food that they needed to support their empires. Uh, and that first age of water with these first empires included the first dams and the first aqueducts and the first institutions to deal with water and the first water laws and the first, ironically, the first wars over water. The first war over water was around 2400 BC in ancient Mesopotamia between two city-states in Sumeria that were fighting over water between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers over access to irrigation water and rich agricultural lands. And so that was really the first age of water. And the first age of water ended, uh, I would argue, when the populations of humans grew and outgrew their local water supplies. And we had to start doing things a little differently. We had to be smarter about water. Um, Expanding city, there were expanding cities, there were growing pressures on limited water resources. 
Uh, and we had to develop the engineering and the science and the culture and the philosophical approaches to deal with growing populations and blossoming civilizations. Uh, and that led to what I argue is the second age of water. And the second age of water is, it's really our age. Uh, with the Islamic uh, golden age in the 900s and the Renaissance in Europe in the 1600s and 1700s and 1800s. And it's really the time when we learned to manipulate the hydrologic cycle in a large way for our benefit. Uh, it encompasses the hydrologic marvels of the Greeks and the Romans that built the first sophisticated aqueducts to move water by gravity to the big cities of the time. We unlocked the biological and the chemical and the, philosophic and the physical properties of water. We learned about germs and water-related diseases, and then we built the technologies to deal with water-related diseases and water quality. Uh, we built the technologies to provide the safe water and sanitation for cities that all of us now take for granted or work with or build and manage and operate today. Uh, the big dams and the aqueducts, not just to move water a few kilometers, but hundreds of kilometers or through and over mountains that, again, we now depend upon for our modern water systems. And ultimately, we replumbed the entire planet in a different way than the beavers, and not to the benefit of the beavers, uh, but to the benefit of ourselves. And the evidence for all of this is very clear, especially in the Western United States. And modern civilization is built on those advances of the second age of water. And we've benefited from those advances in countless ways. We're, we mostly live longer lives. We're mostly richer economically and socially and culturally. Uh, technology and access to information have expanded and exploded in a way, as has our ability to understand and manipulate the world around us. And mostly we take that for granted. And a lot of that is really water related. But we're also now faced with unintended consequences of the second age of water. By the middle of the 20th century, we started to see and to understand better the first evidence of the loss of nature, the rise of environmental problems as the Industrial Revolution accelerated and as populations of humans continued to grow exponentially. The first world wars, uh, uh, skyrocketing pressure on natural resources, Rivers and lakes were treated as dumps for our wastes, and then the rivers started to catch on fire and, and help ignite, in many ways, the environmental movement in the 1960s in the United States. Plastic and, and uh, other wastes are ubiquitous in our waterways now. Algal blooms are clogging our rivers and lakes, and there are new contaminants that are appearing that weren't regulated by some of those things we did in the 60s and 70s. Uh, uh, new, new contaminants like PFAS, like, per, like the, the forever chemicals that we're now beginning to deal with, but are still unregulated. And we have failed to provide safe water and sanitation for billions of people on the planet, even though technologically we know how to do that, and economically we could do that, but there are still billions of people that don't have access to the benefits of the water advances that, again, most of us take for granted. And that's true around the world, but it's also true in California in a, in a problem that in the book I talk about I call water poverty worldwide. Now many of you may know the stories of Flint, Michigan. It was big in the news for a long time. The, the failure of the water system in Flint, Michigan. Uh, the failure more recently in Jackson, Mississippi of the water system there. Uh, where mismanagement and underinvestment in water systems led to contamination. It led to the loss of safe water for thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, mostly in poor frontline communities. But hundreds of thousands of people in California also don't have access to safe water and sanitation. Again, mostly in poor rural communities, in frontline communities, in farm worker towns, in the Central Valley, uh, in Native American reservations that don't have or have never had access to flush toilets and adequate sanitation systems, uh, and that's still a problem here. 
violence associated with water resources, uh, control for water, access to water resources, uh, have worsened in recent years, as have attacks, intentional attacks on water systems. Uh, we've seen that throughout the Middle East, throughout history. Again, the first water war was 2400 BC in the Middle East, but Syria and Iraq have seen intensive attacks uh, on water systems in recent years. And of course, recently we've seen intense attacks on water systems in the Ukraine, uh, by, uh, particularly by the Russians. And we do work on this at the Pacific Institute. We maintain something called the water conflict chronology, for those of you interested in this issue, that tracks water-related attacks on water infrastructure. Peak water limits are being reached as rivers run dry. We overpump the Colorado River. The Yellow River doesn't reach its mouth in parts of the year uh, because we take more water out of those systems than we should. Aquifers, groundwater systems are being depleted. Ecosystems are being destroyed. We're strip mining lands of forests and oceans of fish. Uh, we're driving uncounted species of plants and animals to extinction. And the worst extinctions we're, we're seeing are aquatic ecosystems because, again, specifically of the water we take out of those systems. And of course, most worrisome is the problem of climate change. I'm a climate scientist in part by training. Uh, we know that we're changing the climate. We know that some of the worst impacts of climate change will be on water systems because the hydrologic cycle is the climate system. Evaporation, the formation of clouds, condensation, precipitation, runoff back to land, runoff off the land, back to oceans. That's the climate system as much as it's the hydrologic system. And we're already seeing massive impacts on water systems. Think about the flooding that we've just seen in 2023. It's been an unbelievable year hydrologically in terms of flooding. Uh, the massive floods just this week in Libya where more than 5,000 people have died in Turkey, in Italy, in the northeastern United States. Uh, the flood that occurred in Alaska recently in Juneau that was floodwaters from glaciers that then led to a glacial lake outburst. Um, there, there have just been a disturbingly large number of extreme hydrologic events, not just this year, but in the last few years, that are climate-related. In short, I argue that the, the second age of water, again, our age, brought enormous benefits to us, but it's coming to an end in a race uh, between the growing risks of ecological collapse, massive economic inequality, and political conflict, and the growing effort to apply our hard-earned knowledge and technologies to prevent these kinds of catastrophes. And it's time for a change. It's time to make a transition to what I call the third age of water, where we piece together solutions to the separate challenges of energy and food and climate and integrated, connected to all of those things, water, uh, and offer a different vision, a vision of a way forward to a positive future. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about solutions to our water problems in the talks yesterday and today. And just as we can imagine, just as we can imagine a disastrous future, we can imagine a positive one. And just as our actions that could lead to that bad possible future, uh, they can also lead us to a better future with a balance between human and humans and nature, growing equality and social stability and, and cohesion, and healthy, stable societies. And in my book, I offer this positive vision for the third age of water. And I argue, in fact, that we're going to achieve that. Uh, maybe not in my lifetime, but that we can. Uh, that the solutions are out there. We know how to provide safe water and sanitation to everyone on the planet. It's not a mystery. It doesn't require new technology. It doesn't require, frankly, a lot of money. It requires far less money than the failure to provide safe water and sanitation costs us, and costs in particular the communities that don't have it. And the UN has set a goal of doing that. The Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, have one of their targets as providing 100% of the world's population by 2030 with safe water and sanitation. And we're not going to meet it, I don't think. We're way behind the curve by 2030. But we could meet it sometime if we 
if we commit ourselves to doing so. We know how to use water more productively and efficiently to do the things that we want, to grow the food that we want, not just with beavers, but the largest dam removal pro project in the history of the planet is underway in California now, which has permitted me to continue to work on critical challenges of climate and water and sustainability for so many years. Perhaps that's because the alternatives, the dystopian visions of our sci-fi novels and apocalyptic movies and pessimistic doomsayers, are simply too depressing to accept. It would be a cosmic shame if alone in this small corner of the universe, our spark of intelligent life was not quite intelligent enough to overcome the challenges of living on a finite, delicate planet and fell back into a dark age of chaos or worse went the way of the dinosaurs. That's possible, but it needn't be that way. If we fail to achieve the positive future for water, it won't be because we can't, it will be because we didn't. The hopeful vision for water I offer here is achievable and reachable, and the pieces of it are already apparent in innovative, successful water efforts around the world. It's a future worth fighting for. Thank you very much. Bring a mic. We've, we've been off. through. Yeah, I'll turn it. You have a soft voice. So. I did wait to see if anyone else was going to start. So <laughs> I'll start. Well, Peter, at the end, you'd mentioned you talked about how we've seen increases in uh, population and the leveling off of water use. Now, with our current water systems and the economics of that. Leveling off or decreasing water use means that there's less funding available, less ability to implement the changes that we want. How do you see that being solved? So I assume the question basically ha has to do with this perennial debate about uh, the conflict that water utilities face in encouraging conservation and efficiency and the loss of revenue that comes with that. Um, I, I don't think that's as bad a problem as some people have said. You know, partly it's a question of rate design, partly it's a question of how we fund our water systems, uh, partly it's a question of what we spend our money on. Um, without a doubt, we have, to f we have to rethink the investment question and how we invest in our water systems. And part of the money is going to come from the rates that we all pay and ought to pay for our water systems. Part of the money, historically, uh, has come from public bonds. Uh, the United States built public water systems with public bonds. Uh, and we, we could do more in that regard. The federal government has revolving loan funds. There are lots of different, there are lots of different mechanisms for that. Um, so I don't think that's an insurmountable problem. It, it's a great question. It's a, there's a longer answer that could <laughs> come, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Peter, you said the biggest challenge is politics. I agree with you. Do you have any advice on how to get past some of those obstacles or examples of politics uh, working well. Yeah, so first of all, everyone here ought to run for water boards. <laughs> ah. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, that, that, there's a local answer to that, there's a state answer to that, there's a national answer to that, there's an international answer to that. That's a, that's a, it's a tough question and there are lots of different pieces of it. I'm serious about running for water boards. The, the, the more we have smart water people, working and running our water systems, the more likely we are to, to move in the right direction. And we're moving, I, th I really think we're moving in the right direction. Um, I would love to see, <laughs> I'll, I'll say this, am I being recorded? Uh, you know, I wish we had better governors who understood water systems. You know, we have good, we have a great state politically, but, but uh, we've not really given the attention to the water issue that I think we ought to, given, given how important water is for California. Um, the State Water Resources Control Board is a really important organization. We've had great people on the State Water Resources Control Board, but we have yet to tackle the issue of water rights, which is a really big one in California. We need to revamp the water rights situation, and, and that's, a, that's probably the most difficult political thing, water piece of 
for California now. But look, 10 years ago, if you had asked me, I would have said, we're never going to have groundwater law, but, but we do. And the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act isn't perfect. It's too slow. It's weak. But it's a lot better than no groundwater law, and it's a step in the right direction. And it's started the debate, for example, about revamping agriculture to reduce groundwater overdraft. Um, so it, it, voting <laughs> is important, making sure our politicians understand how important water is. There, there are a few politicians that really think think about water and they ought to be encouraged. And they're on both sides of the aisle. Public opinion polls say that water is really important to the public. That ought to be emphasized to politicians. Um, so there are a lot of different pieces to that. Actually, Peter, I, I, you've got me wondering. I'm going to look up to see if in Congress that there's a water caucus. So there. <laughs> There is a hmm. I, I, there isn't I don't explicitly know. a water caucus, but there are members of Congress on both sides of the aisle who care about water. And I gave a I gave a talk to this group, and I gave a congressional talk uh, about two months ago in June, three whenever June was, <laughs> three or four months ago, um, to a, a group of congressional ele elected Congress people about water. Uh, and they're really interested in it, and there's some legislation that they're interested in. Uh, they ought to be, you know, there ought to be more of them, uh, but there, are, there is a group. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me as a, as good a candidate for a bipartisan issue than... Yeah, so Congressman have. Earl Blumenauer, for example, who represents Portland in Oregon, mm -hmm. uh, coordinates this group. Um, there were, I'd say there were probably a dozen Congressmen and women at the at this it was a breakfast meeting. Um, uh, over representative from California from the West, a lot of people from the West, but but several people people from all over the country. Uh, just to amplify what you said about uh, uh, well, let's say the governor's office um, when early uh, well, last year there was at some point they were making a number of decisions based on scarcity maybe a half dozen, all of them decidedly wrong-headed, but, but the, the reins kind of saved them because they, you know, those decisions were moot. Uh, but I also wanted to ask you, uh, if, if people uh, come to you and just ask you what kind of winter you expect here in, say, Northern California this year, Oh, what do you sure, say? so, so somebody, somebody right before me, one of the talks said, Oh, we're going to have a wet winter. It looks like we're going to have a wet winter this year. I've learned never to predict what <laughs> yes. kind of a winter we're going to have. Um, uh, El Ninos are sort of ambiguous. Again, I'm a climatologist, and El Ninos typically are wetter in Southern California, but they're, it's a little ambiguous what they do for Northern California. So I don't know. Um, like everybody, I was thrilled. Last last winter was really great. Uh, it was just great. We got a huge amount of water and we didn't get the disastrous floods that we worried about. You know, if we had had that wet a winter and then a really hot late winter and early spring, it could have been a disaster, but, but it wasn't. And I would love to see another wet winter, but I've learned also that, that our wet winters are few and far between uh, and they tend to be punctuated by, by droughts. And so you just can't, you just can't let up uh, again, there was a talk right before earlier today. You just can't let up on the drought messaging. You can't let up on the, you can save water because it'll save the planet or you can save water because you'll save money. Uh, Yvonne said this, I, I, I agree completely. And the state ought to be doing that. We ought to be harping on that. Um, there, there are a lot of communications messages that we ought to continue. Yeah. Describing how much water there is uh, on other planets, and so, of course, I can't help but wonder what your thoughts are on uh, exploring water on other planets, as some uh, are doing. Like, should we build a pipeline to? And so yeah, I mean, <laughs> I've always been very against this, so I just, uh, I'm just wondering if you can put that into context. 
It, <laughs> well, so any exploration of other planets, if, if we choose to do that, and I hope we don't choose to do that until we've solved our problems here, but um, uh, is going to depend on water. You know, there, Mars used to have a huge amount of water. It lost a lot of its water over billions of years because for, for a variety of reasons I won't go into. Um, but there is still water on Mars. And if there's going to be any human colonies on Mars, it's going to be where the water is. Because where there's water, there's oxygen. Where there's water, there's hydrogen and methanol and methanes for, for fuels. Uh, so, and, and again, if we go to the moon, it's going to be, we're going to mine the water there because, and I write about this in the book, it's really, really expensive to launch things into space. <laughs> and water is really, really heavy. There's a whole chapter in the book about the water system on the space station, the International Space Station, which if you're interested in recycled water, they've figured it out. They recycle 95% of the water that's on the space station. They pull it out of the air, they pull it out of urine, they pull it out of solid wastes. They recycle it all and they reuse it because it costs $1,000 or more to launch a kilogram of something into space. And they don't, they do, they do launch water because they, they have to replace it over time, but they prefer not to. And we're not gonna take the water with us wherever we go. Thank you. Thank you.